Open our third year, chapter 12, Steady Hand. It's the morning after flight from Hawaii, and all of your roommates are a little bleary from jet lag. Please tell me someone's made coffee. Already on the second pod. I got zero sleep last night. Only petting locum and cinnamon on your lap is giving you any sort of energy. Oh yes, yes, locum, I know. I missed you too. <laughs> of course I missed you as much, sweetie. Hey, how come you get both the fuzzy pets while I get a crush? I think crush is just as pettable as the others. I am officially not looking forward to trying to stay awake all day. See, this is why I love my job. All I have to do is giving marching orders to interns, then take a nap in the back room. I'm fairly certain being chief resident involves a little more than that. You all chuckle a little, but Sienna surprisingly doesn't join in. But Sienna, what's wrong? You look like you just came from a funeral, not a f wedding. That's the problem. After such an incredible time in Hawaii, the board exams are starting to feel a little too real. Honestly, I'm... Waiting until the coffee kicks in. I'm too tired to even decide whether I'm happy or sad to be back at work. She has a point, though, Sienna. It's easy to feel crappy about work when you are still tired. I don't think it's that. To be honest, I managed to sleep pretty well on the flight, so... I don't know why you're freaking out about the boards, Sienna. You're super smart. It's not just the boards lately. I've been wondering whether... She trails off and then seems to rethink things. Never mind, it's just not important. Just back to work blues, I guess. Still, looking on the bright side, the kids in the pets ward will be so excited to have you back. Good point, actually. Now I'm kind of eager to head in. Good for you. Does that mean us can have your coffee? Ooh, I'm kind of like that. Yo, can I have your stuff? <laughs> You're just arriving at the diagnostics office when you spot Harbor down the hall, deep in conversation with... Bryce, what are they talking about? Please, Dr. Emery. I need to be removed from Henry's surgery. I don't understand why. The patient specifically requested you on the team. I had slated you for lead on this procedure. I just can't do this for operation. Please, just this once. All right, if it's that important to you, I'll pull you off of it. Thank you. I'll make it up to you somehow. Turns and walks slowly down the corridors. Harper frowns after him in confusion. I know he didn't think Henry should take the risk, but I still can't believe he's asking not to be on a once-in-a-lifetime surgery. I should... Chase after Bryce. Wait, Bryce, hold up. Dash to the busy hallway, lay weaving between doctors and patients to catch up. Keeps walking for a while, but finally stops and turns. Hey, Casey, I'm guessing you heard all that. I did, but Bryce, are you sure you want to back out on Henry's operation? The operation shouldn't be happening in the first place. It's way too risky. And considering that, I just can't be the one to lead it. Bryce. Sorry, Casey, but I'm just not really up for talking about it. I have to go. He turns and leaves, and you sigh as you watch him go, shaking your head, your turn back to go to the office. Ethan looks up and smiles slightly as he sees you enter. It fades slightly as Tobias comes in just behind you. Ah, Ethan, in the, his chair as he should be. All is right with the world. What's our mission, fearless leader? Okay, I'm getting tired of your bullshit. Actually, we have two potential cases today. So a little bit of democracy might finally be warranted. He passes out two folders to each of you and explains each as you read them. First patient is a 35-year-old mother of two. She's experiencing joint pain, severe fatigue, muscle weakness, and intermittent fever. Any possibility of some kind of infection? Maybe a parasite? Her PCP ruled out uh, the most common infection. She hasn't traveled outside the country in years, so parasites aren't likely, uh, particularly likely. Harper looks up from the file, eyebrow raised. Then the most likely cause is some sort of autoimmune disease. Ah, uh, by which you mean the exact sort of disorder blooms constantly trying to force down our throats. 
Exactly my thinking, which is why I'm considering the second case. Wait, a second? Hmm, I thought you cared about, cared about patients first. It's hardly her fault if Bloom is interested in diseases like hers. I tend to agree with uh, Casey. We can't turn her away just to avoid bureaucratic headaches. I'm not turning anyone away. This is just a preliminary discussion and I want us to consider all options. The whole point of this team is to help the patient with the greatest need, but we haven't determined who that is quite yet. You all open up the next folder as Ethan goes over the details of the second case. Case number two, 38 year old man who works as an airline baggage handler. It says he's reporting feeling run down, gaining weight, and swelling in his feet and ankles that won't go away. Though he's on his feet all day, he's stuck eating in airport food? Am I the only one who thinks his symptoms are his job? It's possible, but imagine uh, he wouldn't come in if there weren't any noticeably out of the ordinary. It looks like the baggage handler's insurance doesn't cover the diagnostics team. This would have to be pro bono, considering the friction between the team and Bloom recently. He might see choosing a pro bono case as a deliberate gesture. A good point. Picking the first patient might help smooth things over with Bloom. In that case, I think I've decided baggage handler it is. Casey, you and Harper handle the interview with the intake samples. In the meantime, I'll contact the first patient's primary physician and recommend specific tests for autoimmune conditions. By smirks, clearly amused, but Harper presses her lips together in a thin line. All right, Casey, I'll meet you there. I have to make some quick uh, updates to the surgical schedule. Ah, uh, if we're done here, I'm gonna get started on my rounds. They both head out the door, leaving you alone with Ethan. Ethan, I understand why you have issues with him. Why are you deliberately antagonizing Bloom? We've both been through this before. Casey Bloom took a shot and missed. Now it's time to get back to doing what I've always done. Which is? Treating the patient with the most need. Autoimmune diseases require long-term management, which is better than handled through their PCP. Besides, a patient with limited insurance is far less likely to have his condition explained. He deserves quality care, too. I agree with that. I hear you. And I think you made the right call. It's nice to have a patient who uh, really needs this team. Bloom won't like it, but when uh, he was going to like anything you did. Just be careful, alright? There's a difference between standing up for your patients and picking a fight. I really don't think there's any need to worry, but I appreciate the thought. Thank you. Smiling, you head out to talk to your new patient. You introduce yourself to a new patient, a Mr. Greg Mariano. Harbor arrives just in time for you to start learning more about his history. So, what's bothering you most, Greg? Well, definitely the swelling. Uh, is it your neck swelling too? Because holy shit, it's bigger than your head. Definitely the swelling. There are days that I can't even get my slippers on. Let alone my boots or shoes. I mean, look for yourself. Draw the covers back to reveal puffy and flame looking legs and feet. You also reported unusual weight gain and exhaustion. Yeah, and I don't mean run of the mill exhaustion. I'm used to that. I mean, I mean, I, I hit by a truck kind of exhaustion, you know? Interesting. Any new medications? Nope, no medications. Period. Usually, I'm pretty healthy. I've all I never needed any. Okay, any major changes in substances, caffeine, alcohol, say? Nah, I'm not much of a drinker, and uh, more than one cup of coffee a day makes me jittery. It's, uh, it was like one day, and I felt fine, the next this. Hmm, in that case, Dr. Emery and I will take some samples and get started on testing. You've just dropped Craig's samples at the lab, and you spot Raph working with a patient in the hallway. Dr. Valentine! Max, so good to see you. How have you been? A lot better since you guys threw that birthday party for me. I think cake is medicine. Dr. Valentine is too smart to buy that. And I do think uh, having your friends visit helped you out. They're ready to show me how much stronger it made you feel. Uh, definitely. What do I have to do? I want you to try running. To the end of the hole and back. On your own. Running? Not, not just walking and now you're holding me up you don't need me to hold you up bud that's why we've been building up your muscles again you got this oh okay if you say so he 
starts off down the hall, his pace a little halted, slow to begin with, but soon he's moving faster, his gait running, growing more regular. I'm doing it! I'm doing it! By the time he gets back from the end of the hall, he's all flushed, panting, and grinning in excitement, you and Raph of both applaud and cheer. Great job, champ. I knew you had it in you. I, I didn't think I could do it, but then I ran so fast, and I, I didn't even trip once. I told you, bud. You've been working so hard, and I'm proud of you. Holds out a hand to high-five him, which Mac eagerly takes. I think you've earned a break after all that hard work. If you uh, go to lounge, the nurses might be setting up a movie. Really? That's so cool. Thanks, Raph. He heads off towards the lounge, moving more comfortably than ever just a few minutes ago. You share a warm look with Raph. Looks like success story is in the making. Clearly, you're good at physical therapy thing. Oh, starting to feel that way. In fact, just then, his watch beeps. Oh, speaking of which, I should get going. Uh, Pedro set up another house, calling his helicopter is just a few minutes away. Wow, another house call? Hey, you treat him more easily here. The physical therapy suite Bloom made is state-of-the-art. Absolutely, but if there's uh, anyone who has more exercise equipment than a physical therapist, it's a professional athlete. Pedro has an indoor pool, swimming is great for rebuilding his muscles after injuries like his, and sounds like a win-win, I guess. Yeah, speaking of which, if you wanted, you could tag along. I'm sure Pedro wouldn't mind, and I'd love the company. Besides, you've got to see this guy's mansion for yourself. Hmm, I do have an hour or two to, while I wait for quick samples to come back. Pay a visit to Pedro's mansion with Raph and enjoy the pool and the perks. I guess the perks are looking at Raph shirtless. I'm in. Awesome. Let's head up to the roof. I think our uh, helicopter's waiting. After a short but thrilling helicopter ride, you and Raph are deposited gently in the large garden outside of Pedro's house. Pedro himself is already waiting for you, grinning as you both get out. Raph, my man, thanks for coming again. And Casey, so good to see you again. Likewise, I hope you don't mind me crashing the party. Are you kidding? The more help I can get, the better. On that note, should we uh, head to the pool? You quickly change in your swimsuit and head out in the luxurious pool area. You find Raph and Pedro already in the water beginning their drills. Alright, so just like last time, we're going to start with your arms uh, as wide as you can. Manage, hands in the water. And then push them through the water to bring your hands together. Right, I remember this one. You're just about to slip into the water for a quick lap when an assistant runs in, wringing his hands. Uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro, I'm sorry, I, I know this is important, but your manager is on the phone. He needs to speak with you right away. Oh, for the... Tell him I'm busy. He knows my therapy schedule can't move. I already told him, but he's insisting. It's contract related. He said it's really time sensitive and confidential. Glances over at you and Raph. Uh, fine, I'll be right there. <sighs> Raph, Casey, I'm sorry, but I better take this. Please enjoy the pool. I'll be back as soon as I can, but this might take a little while. Mm-hmm, just enough time for us to speak or whatever. Ah, uh, no worries, man. Not exactly a burden to have this place to ourselves. Pedro smiles and thanks, and then hops out of the pool. Slips on a robe and follows his assistant back into the house. Raph looks up at you, still perched on the pool's edge and grins. Oh, looks like we gotta pull to ourselves for a bit. Any ideas how to use it? Mmm, definitely. Time for a nice, relaxing float. You slow into the pool carefully, relishing the comfortable warmth of the water. Right now, I uh, feel like I'm floating on my back and letting everything drift away. It's sort of like mini Hawaii. Now oh, that does sound nice, actually. We sometimes do a variant of that for the patients to help with their coordination. Very therapeutic. To be fair, they had a different sort of therapeutic effect in mind. Smiling, you let your legs float to the water, supporting your whole weight, closing your eyes, you sense Raph following suit beside you. Relaxing, adjusting your body so that you float properly, you take in a deep breath and let it out, feeling your body rise and fall in the water. Man, this is really peaceful. I know, right? As much fun as splashing around can be, sometimes just chilling and floating is the most fun you can have at a pool. I agree. 
Why could you not accidentally fall asleep and choke on a mouthful of chlorine? You float for a while longer, time stretching as you relax and let your mind drift along with your body. Eventually, however, you're interrupted by your stomach growling. I mm, guess all the swimming has worked up in an appetite. Do you think Pedro would mind if we went to the house and found the kitchen, or...? No need. Check it out. He points to the far side of the pool area, where you notice a well-equipped mini-fridge with a kitchen, with a pantry, fridge, and even a blender and a toaster oven. Pedro spends a lot of time here, or uh, in the private jet next door, gym next door, so uh, he put in a mini-kitchen here, so uh, he keeps it fully stocked. You open up the cupboards and gawk at the stash of snacks and treats. Whoa, I see what you mean. I could go for a milkshake, something healthy, a fancy looking cheese. Something healthy. The fruit platter looks perfect, especially the pineapple. After the trip, I'm dying for a hit of the tropics. Dibs on the strawberries. As you savor the post swim snack, your eyes fall on the last thing in the pool area you haven't tried yet. A very enticing looking hot tub. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Raph follows your gaze and grins. Uh, he can be helpful at using muscle tension and improving circulation. As a physical therapist, I should test it out for research. Definitely consider me your research assistant. You turn on the jet, slip into the hot tub, cooing in pleasure as the heat envelops you and gently releases the tension from your muscles. Buying an ecstasy, you lean back, close your eyes, savoring the seductive warmth. Raph slips in beside you, leaning back in a mirror image of your posture. Oh, glad you came. I never want to leave, but you know what would make this uh, even better? Turn the jets to max. Uh, let me guess, for research? Only responsible thing, really. Raph hops out to flip the jets up to high, soon you're vibrating with the force of water against your skin. Muscles melting pleasantly with each passing moment. Mm, promise me either of us is ever mega rich. We'll invite the other over to our private indoor hot tub. Mm, not that it's ever going to be a real issue, but deal. Before long, Raph's scheduled hour is up and Pedro still has a return. Mm, wow. Must have been a pretty important call to keep him that long. He's never done this before. <sighs> He's certainly been gone a long time. Not that I minded. I don't know about you, but this was my favorite therapy consult much, uh, pretty much ever. I <laughs> can't argue with that. It's certainly been a lot less uh, work than my usual house calls. But to be fair, Pedro's a lot of fun to hang out with. It's too bad we haven't seen much of him. Uh, before we head out, uh, mind if I go check on Pedro? I figure I should at least say goodbye. Sure thing. Just let me get changed real quickly. Fully dressed, the two of you enter the rest of Pedro's sprawling estate, searching for him from room to room until you hear his friendly but frustrated voice coming from the polite old kitchen. Yes, Jerry, I think it's a great idea, but I have to go. I left Raph downstairs in the pool almost an hour ago, and I'm about to run out of my... You already have, my friend. He pauses to listen on the end of the line, then notices you two standing at the doorway. His eyes widen as he glances at the clock, wincing as he sees the time. Yes, Jerry, I will tell him. Yep, that's... that's... I think that's everything. If there's nothing else, great. Bye. He hangs up and turns to you with apologetic expression. I'm sorry, you two. I hate that I uh, wasted your time this way. No big deal. These things happen, man. And frankly, you know all the exercises by this point, so you can just do them yourself today. I'll text you the reps and some videos for reference, just in case you forgot. Oh, your lifesaver arrived. This is exactly why I told my manager, Jerry, to get you. Get me? What do you mean? Of right, of course. I haven't asked you yet. Well, then, uh, let me be the official offer. I want you to come and work full-time for the Marauders when I go back next month. Wait, what, are you saying... You want Raph as your team's full-time physical therapist? Wow, congrats, Raph. I'm so happy for you. You burned this, Raph. Holy cow, I mean, I'm just... I don't know what to say. Obviously, I'm hoping you'll say yes. But I think this is a bit of a surprise. I could want to hope. Are you kidding? This is amazing. I don't think I've ever felt more flattered in my life. Like I said, Raph, you deserve it. 
an offer from uh, your favorite team, a chance to work with Pedro every day, it's uh, like a dream job. Ah, it is a dream job, man. I'm just still reeling. Anyway, take some time to think about it. I think it's a big decision and uh, kind of sudden, so uh, just uh, let me know when you uh, when you can. Definitely, like, and thank you so much for the offer. I'm still mind blown over here. Uh, no problem, man. See you later, and uh, nice uh, seeing you again, Casey. You and Raph walk back outside to where the helicopter is waiting to take you back to the hospital. Raph is uncharacteristically quiet, clearly in a bit of a happy daze. Raph, what are you going to do? Honestly, I have no idea. After a few hours of results from your patients, first round of tests are ready. You get to the lab and find Tobias already there. Ah, oh, there you are. Take a look at these. Ethan's gonna be so annoying. Why? What's wrong? In answer, he hands you the folder of test results. Whoa, the protein levels in his urine are off the charts. Yep, ANA looks normal, so all things considered, the most likely cause is membrosis nephropathy. Which means that uh, after everything this morning, Ethan still ended up with an autoimmune patient. <laughs> looks like you're right. Um, it's actually kind of funny. Oh god, I shouldn't be laughing, but I swear every time we think we're getting one over on Bloom... <laughs> hey, better laugh about it than cry, or just grump constantly like Ethan. Alright, I'll uh, take a GFR test to get a general sense of his kidney function. Make sure we're not dealing with any permanent damage. I'll start uh, him on uh, diuretics and ACE inhibitors to relieve the symptoms. We'll know by tomorrow if they're working. Sounds like a plan. On that note, I've got some clinic hours to get through. Bearing goodbye, you head down to the free clinic, leaving Tobias to handle the patient. As you cross the lobby towards the clinic, you see a familiar face at the front desk. Hey, Casey! Henry, long time to see. Eh, been a while since we uh, escaped each other, huh? Are you uh, checking out? Actually, this is my last check-in before my big surgery. Tomorrow morning. Wow, that's major. What made you decide to do it? I did my research. Spine shortening procedures can help spine a bifida patients like me and prevent things like tethered cord syndrome. The alternative is yearly surgeries indefinitely, and recovery gets harder every time. Since my uh, last one, pain has uh, been pretty constant. I'm so sorry to hear that. I just wish for your sake the risks weren't so high. Oh, it is what it is. I, I know it's a long shot or uh, that it might go wrong, but I have to try, man. Uh, the reward is worth the risk, even the wor worth the ri worst risk. Have you talked to Bryce about the surgery? Henry's face falls and he rubs the back of his head ruefully. Actually, I haven't been able to get a hold of Bryce. I kind of get the feeling he's avoiding my calls. I asked for him to be on the surgical team, but right now I don't even know if he'd uh, be... if he'll be there. They won't tell me anything. Even if he doesn't perform the surgery, I want to get a hold of him. Bryce is a good friend. I don't want things to end on a weird note. Things to end... Henry... Just being realistic, man. If the worst happens, I want us to have ended on a... on a laugh and a hug, and... I think he's, uh, afraid he'll say the wrong thing to me. Trails off, frowning sadly, and then he shakes himself, forcing himself to perk up and smile at you. Anyway, nice seeing you again, Aunt Casey. He waves and heads out the door. You watch him go, and then sigh thoughtfully. After a moment, you page Bryce. I find Bryce in an empty corner of the doctor's round, practically buried under a stack of books. He looks more frantic and desperate than you've ever seen him. Ah, oh, hey, Casey. Sorry. Can't chat for too long. I've got a stuff to cover here. Techniques for SSVO? These are books about Henry's procedure. Is this to prepare for doing it? What? No. It's to convince him that he needs to cancel it. Look for yourself. The procedure's crazy complicated. And his lead surgeon has never even done one of these. Besides, he hasn't operated on Henry before. She doesn't know his history or have first-hand familiarity with scar tissue on his spine. Or... Bryce... It's Henry's choice. I know, but I'm the surgeon. Shouldn't I help him make the best choice? Make sure he do knows what he's getting into? I'm 
pretty sure he knows already. At some point, you have to just let all that go and just be his friend. Shakes his head even more frantically. Maybe if I just lay out the actual numbers or help uh, design an alternative treatment tr schedule that isn't so tough on him. Bryce, I don't think you can change his mind. Bryce deflates at that, sagging a little. You gently put a reassuring hand on his shoulder. What can you... What you can do is talk to him. He told me that's what he wants most of all, whether you do the surgery or not. I... I know. But how can I face him when I've pulled myself off his surgery? How can I expect him to forgive me for that? Poor Bryce. He's clearly struggling. I wonder if he'd have an easier time working through this with someone at his side. Get dressed up for a night on the town with Bryce and Henry and help them reconnect before the big day. This exclusive scene not only unlocks time with Bryce, but also gives you a new outfit in your closet. Okay. Hmm. Not a bad outfit if I don't say so myself. Live it up, fam. Bryce, you'll regret it if you don't see him before the surgery, even if things go perfectly. And if they don't, trust me, I've been thinking about that. Besides your buddies, right? Say your buddy deserves a night on the town to take his mind off things before something uh, so risky. Plus, you'll have an easier time explaining your concerns face to face. I can even tag along if it'll make things easier for you. Bryce perks up with that. We do have a great time together. Maybe when he's in a good mood, he'll finally see sense. Plus, we're overdue for a night out. On that note, I'm gonna go finish my rounds and get changed. Meet you downstairs after my shift. Sometime later, you've changed into an outfit you've been saving for a special occasion. Holy, you look incredible, Casey. I clean up all right. If that's all right, remind me to uh, be there when you hit great. You sure you want to invite Henry along with you dressed like that? I'm having some very private thoughts. And we're in not-so-private relationship. Keep your good distance. Maybe if you're lucky, I'll let you uh, tell me after a few of them later. Bryce wraps an arm around the small of your back, pulling you in for a quick but passionate kiss, because this apparently is a thing. Seriously, when did this become a thing? Eventually, though, you pull by away. Even uh, enough of that. This night's about Henry, right? I've been trying to think of where to tell Henry to meet us, but honestly, I'm kind of stumped. Usually we do escape rooms, but that's pretty involved. I want us to just be able to talk. It would be a little hard to have a heart-to-heart -heart when you're madly trying to solve uh, or puzzle out clues. How about we go um, to a fancy restaurant? Sounds perfect. We'd definitely be able to talk there. I'll text Henry and tell him to meet us. A few minutes later, the two of you head out into the nine. Soon you arrive at the restaurant where you're escorted to a comfortable corner table. May as well uh, take a look at the menu so we're ready to order when Henry gets here. But before you get a chance to crack it, a maitre d' appears again, this time guiding Henry to your table. He smiles. Hey, Casey, nice to see you again. You too, Bryce. And yeah, man, uh, me too. I mean, uh, nice to see you too. Uh, not nice to see me. Jeez, uh, uh, uh. Bryce must be nervous. I've never seen him that lost for words. This is where you look at Bryce and just go, Use your words, dude! Expect one or both of them to start talking, but the silence draws out uncomfortably. Henry pretends to read the menu, but keeps glancing at Bryce. Oh boy, they clearly need some help getting this conversation going. Maybe I should break the ice. Hey, guys. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh. Listen, guys, have an awkward time with shit, okay? Girls just... All right, listen, sister, we need to talk. Bryce owes you an apology, Henry. Oh, yeah? Shoot uh, a raised eyebrow at Bryce, who sighs, flashing you a rueful smile. Yeah, I need to apologize for avoiding you. It wasn't anything you did, I just wasn't sure what to say. I figured you were mad at me for going through with the operation. No way, I mean, yeah, I think it's a bad idea, but it doesn't mean I don't understand why you'd want to do it. I wasn't avoiding you because I was mad, I was avoiding you because I thought you would be mad at me. Why would I be mad at you? Rice tries to answer, but you see the words die on his lips. He ducks his head, and Henry frowns, then uh, raises his eyebrows. Bryce, tell me honestly, are you doing my surgery or not? 
Ice Tan says and lets out a long, shattering breath. No. Not. I just can't. Why not? You're one of the best surgeons I've ever met. Maybe an entire state. I asked for you specifically because... Henry, the last time I operated someone... I knew I just... I just... Rye shakes his head, unable to continue. Confused, Henry looks for you for an explanation. Look, Henry... It's Bryce's story to tell. I don't want to go into it. It's just, I'm not the amazing wonder surgeon you seem to think I am. Dude, I never thought you were a wonder. Just really good. And more importantly, you're my friend. Doesn't mean I should be the one to do this operation. Hell, as your friend, I don't think I should be doing an operation at all. Or you should. Rye sighs, pushing his hair out of his eyes. Henry, the surgery is so risky. And I've had some hiccups doing risky operations on people I knew. I can't risk your life. I don't want you taking the risk at all, but if you're determined, I can't be the one if things go wrong. He pauses, clearly trying to rein in his emotions. Henry, frowning sadly, reaches out and puts his hand over Bryce's. I can't risk your life, Henry. I won't. Bryce, I get it. I do. But you're taking your too much on yourself. You're risking my life. I am. Believe me, I did my research. I read every statistic, learned every possible outcome. I know the chances that I, I make it through this are very low. But I still have to try because the alternative is the pain gets worse and worse for the rest of my life until I can't take it anymore. I could help you manage it. For now, but not forever. You know things are going to keep declining. If there was some other treatment, believe me, I'd be all over it. But I'm past that point, so I've got two choices. Take a huge risk or continue living in constant pain. I've made my choice. But why me? Why not ask one of the most experienced surgeons? Because those more experienced surgeons don't know me, Bryce. I'm not just another patient to them, another procedure to try. I asked for you because, yeah, you're the best, but also I know that you'll do everything you can for me up to the last second. The truth is, I asked because I know in my heart that if literally anyone can get me through this, it's going to be you. Henry. Trails off, clearly moved, and you clear your throat. <clears throat> um, Bryce, you should do it because... You're in Henry's corner. You heard what Henry said. The other surgeons may be good, but they don't know him like you do. They don't have a personal stake. Funny you say that. Are we supposed to keep things distant and professional in our jobs? Screw that. We do our best work when we care. And you care with your whole heart. That's what makes you a great doctor. I know that as long as you're in the OR, there is not a single thing you won't do to help him. Yeah. And that's what I want. If I'm going to have a fighting chance, I can't think of anyone else I'd want in my corner. Henry. Rye lowers his gaze for a moment. When he lifts his head again, his eyes look suspiciously shiny. Alright, if it means that much to you, and I know it does, then I'll do the surgery for you. You will? Yeah, but only because you really shore up my escape room team. Henry tries to reply, but he chokes up and instead flings his arms open and hugs Bryce with all of his mind. Bryce hugs back, just as hard, burying his face in his friend's shoulder. After a minute, they break apart, smiling at each other and patting each other on the shoulder. Man, I came out here to convince you not to go through with it. Hey, I can be very persuasive. So can Casey. She's the one who got me to get over myself long enough to talk to you, after all. I'm sure you two would have figured it out without my input, but I'm glad I was able to help. And on that note, pick up your drink and raise it high. A toast to the next escape room. Henry and Bryce burst into surprised and relieved laughter. Yeah, there's a new nuclear apocalypse theme room at the place across town. I get through this, you and me are taking it on, Bryce. You mean we're slaying it. Oh shit, yeah. <laughs> Laughing, you clink cups and drink. Alright, I'm starving. What's on the menu? Uh, is it wrong for me to be tempted and uh, to order the most expensive thing? Um, hey, if not now, then when? You deserve a treat, Henry. 
we all do as far as I'm concerned. Let's take a look at that menu. A few minutes later, the three of you gasp as the waiter brings you the most expensive thing in the menu. Lobster and truffle ravioli smothered in caviar. Oh my god, it tastes like heaven. I always wanted to splash out on something like this. The shocking thing is that that, that didn't disappoint. Hey, can we order another one? It would almost be worth pitching in a month's salary for. A month's salary as an operating doctor. Do you realize how expensive that dish then is? Oh boy. An hour or two later, sated with the lovely flavors of lobster, truffle, and caviar, you and Bryce say your goodbyes to Henry. See you tomorrow morning, man. You have no idea how good it is to hear you say that. With one last fist bump, Henry rolls towards the exit, leaving you and Bryce alone. Bryce slips his hand in yours and squeezes gently. Thank you, Casey. I wouldn't have had the courage to do this for him if it weren't for you. Yes, you would. I just gave you a little nudge in the right direction. He turns to you and gently cups your cheek in his hand. Bryce is kind of like a side piece, apparently, that we can't refuse. Weird. And thank you for believing in me. Always. He leans in and kisses you, the touch of his lips warm and sweet. You wrap your arms around his neck, pulling him closer. Eventually, you part and you lean your head on his shoulder, the two of you embracing for a long time. I like how they just force this on us, though. The next morning, you head in the diagnostics office, only to find Harper still hasn't arrived. Fifteen minutes later, she hurries in, looking slightly flustered. Sorry I'm late. There was a last-minute change to the surgery schedule that I had to organize. I know that change was good luck, Henry. And good luck to Bryce, too. You didn't miss anything, Harper. We were only going over Craig's latest results. You, Tobias, and Harper all glance over the updated chart and look up in surprise. Wait, he hasn't improved at all? I don't understand. We're giving him the appropriate treatment for, uh, ne nephropathy, and there's been no change? Could we have been wrong about the initial diagnosis? All his tests indicate it. By now, he shouldn't... He shouldn't be improving. His symptoms should have more or less disappeared. I suppose we'll have to just wait and watch. Hope that the patient improves. Something in Ethan's voice makes you pause and glance over at him. Notice his unusual morose hair. Harper also glances his way, but Tobias, oblivious, stands to go. All right, well, I better get back to my rounds and page me if anything changes. He heads out with Harper following close behind. You're about to head out as well, but pause at the door, looking it back at Ethan. Hey, Ethan. What's wrong? You're not usually this down about our patients, Ethan. Not unless it's a really dire case, which this doesn't seem to be. Is everything okay? Has Bloom been giving you a hard time again, or...? Unexpectedly chuckles at that. <laughs> no, not exactly. We actually haven't really spoken since the hearing. Then why do you seem so troubled? Ethan looks at you, and you see a million emotions glimmering in his eyes, and then he sighs. It's really nothing. I don't uh, want to bother you with it. Ethan, you know I'm here for you. No matter what's going on, I care about you. I know, but really, everything is fine. You nod quietly, sensing that he's not ready to discuss what's going on, and for now, you'll have to be in the dark. Basically, if it's not the patient's autoimmune disease, then it's something significantly worse. Or the fact that his disease might be beyond reproach of medicine. Several hours later, you're finishing up your rounds when you see Bryce on the other side of the hallway, walking slowly, not noticing you at first. Bryce, I was hoping I'd run into you. How'd it go? He doesn't answer right away, and then slowly, dazedly, turns to you. Your heart sinks as you see his expression, his eyes misting up. He's gone, Casey. We lost him. In a private corner of the doctor's lounge, you hand Bryce a glass of water. He takes it quietly, staring off into space, his face looking older, somehow. Full of grief, but oddly calm. Do you want to talk about it? There's actually not a lot to talk about. We did everything right. Made it through the hardest part of the surgery with no snags. Things were looking really good. Then his blood pressure plummeted. Nothing we did it just happened. We did everything we could, but we just couldn't bring him back. Oh, Bryce. 
It was just too hard on his body. It couldn't hold out. It sounds like you need a hug. I definitely wouldn't turn it down. You enfold Bryce in a big comforting hug. You feel him sigh and a little tension seeps out of him. When you pull apart, Bryce's eyes are more misty, but he remains calm and almost peaceful. Thanks, Casey. That does make me feel a little better, actually. Bryce looks at you, thankfully. I'm so glad you pushed me to see him last night. It sounds weird, but even though I saw him in the OR, last night feels more like a real last memory of him. And it was a really good one. That's not weird at all. That's the whole point, in a way. And it made a real difference. I know now that in my heart he had no doubts. And no regrets. Ice trails off. In the distance. Thoughtfully. So how are you feeling right now? Truthfully, I'm actually doing okay. Better than I thought I'd be if this happened. I know in my gut that I did the absolute best work I could, and no one could have done it better. And I'm not talking about from my ego here. No, I get it. Sometimes you can do everything perfectly and still lose. Exactly. I guess it's all just part of the job. Probably the last guy or a uh, year to learn that, huh? forces out a laugh, but you can hear the strain. Anyway, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. I just need a little time. That's all. Bryce seems better than I expected, but this must still be hard on him. I'm sure he could use a friend right now. I must write with Bri Bryce and your friends as you share war stories of your years as doctors. First round's on me. Pull out your phone, start texting in the group chat. What are you doing? Sending out the Bryce signal. Our shift's almost over. I think the others agree with me that you could use a friend right now. That's really, really sweet, but you guys don't have to. Smiles, the group chat begins to light up with supportive messages and eagerness to meet up. I know we don't, Bryce, but we want to. A while later, you and Bryce are sitting at your regular table with the rest of the gang. The mood, surprisingly, is anything but somber. So Henry and I had to figure out the last puzzle to escape. It was a big math thing that we only had a minute to solve. So what did you do? Seriously, we know scalpel jockeys can't count higher than their fingers and toes. No joke. Henry leans forward, reaches under his butt in the wheelchair, and pulls out a freaking calculator. Ah, the classic maneuver. No one checks the wheelchair for contraband. It's true. Everyone at the table laughs, but slowly Bryce's face falls as reality sets in. I can't believe he's really gone. Oh, Bryce. Anna leans over and hugs him, but while Raph puts his shoulder comfortably. Bryce. This is the part of the job we do. I wish it was easy. Being a good doctor, never losing a patient again, but we've all lost patients, and we're all going to lose more. Part of being the best doctor as we can be is being able to absorb that, recover, and push on in the next case. Yeah, but here's the thing is, you eventually become desensitized. You lose the compassion, the literal passion, and a lot of other things dwindle throughout the years. Yeah, I guess I haven't had much practice with that. I'm not used to losing people on my table, plus Henry was someone special. I think every doctor has cases that just stick with them. Cases where there was no right answer. Sounds like you're speaking from experience, Jackie. Jackie takes a slow sip of her beer and nods. Mr. Bozeman. He was a dialysis patient last year in his 80s. An absolute sweetheart. Loved to make it up nicknames that would rile me up. He finally got approved for a kidney transplant, but I started noticing uh, he seemed confused when we spoke. Turned out it was Alzheimer's. Oh no, there's no way they'd give him a kidney with that diagnosis. Yeah, I decided I owed it to him to give him the news myself. Not gonna lie, I still sometimes think about the look on his face. She takes a shaky breath and another sip of her drink. Bryce smiles sadly and... 
understanding and raises his bottle to clink of his with hers. That's funny. I've never really talked about him with anyone before. Sorry, Bryce, I didn't mean to... It actually kind of helps, to be honest. Uh, it's like war stories, right? We've all got them. And sometimes sharing them helps. Some of mine still make me cry. Particularly hope. Sure enough, she gets choked up, tears coming to her eyes. Fishing in her purse, she pulls out her tissues. She was only six, but she had advanced leukemia. There was nothing any of us could do that seemed to work. I checked on her every day, tried to ease her symptoms. It was difficult watching the sweet little girl waste away. And then one day I arrived at work, went to her room first thing, and the bed was empty. She tries to say more, but breaks down in tears, eyes swimming in sympathy. Aurora wraps an arm around her shoulder. <sighs> no, Sienna, I'm so sorry. You made such a difference. You were there with her every step of the way, giving her spirits up even if you couldn't cure her. You absolutely helped. That's what her parents told me. They still send me Christmas cards, actually, but a part of me feels like I failed her. Sometimes, there's just no way to fix things. But that doesn't mean you didn't help. You did everything you could, and much, much more. Thanks, Casey. Cases involving children always hit a little differently. I actually had a pretty tough call with one in my trial recently. Really? I thought you didn't interact with patients in the trials much. I don't. Not really. Mostly I just administer the drug, take their vitals, get their info, that kind of thing. And when I do talk to a trial patient, they're so excited and happy to be a part of it. But this kid, Derek, when I went to take his info, his condition was clearly getting worse. Obviously, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure he was on the placebo. Right. He reminded me a lot of myself, too. It's funny. I went into research to help patients like that. I know on some level I am, but a lot of the time the data feels abstract. Just numbers. It can be easy to forget that every data point is a person, and that sometimes research has a human cost. Luckily, I had a good friend to remind me of that. He smiles warmly at you, and you smile back. How about you, Aurora? You don't talk much about your patients, but I can imagine you've had some tough cases, too. Yeah. There's one from my first year that sticks with me. There was a major accident, lots of injuries, burns. I was on the ER rotation. There were so many critically injured patients, and some of them weren't going to make it. That sounds hard. Literally, that's how, that sounds how we started. Remember? Think back to when Open Heart first started. We literally had that happen. There was this moment where I was looking at two patients, Miss Thompson and her grandson. Her body was shutting down. She flatlined. There was not enough time or enough doctors for everyone there. I could only focus on one of them. So I made my choice. That's what triage is about. Aurora, you didn't have to do anything wrong. Oh, I know. I made the right call, but I was so green. I actually expected to feel, I don't know, vindicated? Instead, I felt drained, sad, guilty, like a failure, even though we saved the grandson's life. I've been in a lot of triage situations. It never gets easier. Sounds like you have some more stories of your own, Raph. Tons. Even as a physical therapist, I had to tangle some hard stuff. Patients who will never recover mobility or health. And you lose a lot of people as a paramedic. It was always tough, especially when you loved one, uh, when a loved one was riding along. But in terms of things that uh, keep me up at night, I don't think a day goes by when I don't remember Danny and Bobby. You all nod somberly remember the tragic incident that killed both of them, and nearly killed you and Raph as well. I, I think about Danny and Bobby a lot too. Even if they weren't my patients, I feel responsible for them. If that makes sense. But the case that haunts me the most is... Dolores. The first patient I lost. Dolores was the, one of the first patients I had in my first year. She was Ethan's first patient before that. She was a lovely, 
funny, warm. She showed signs of preeclampsia in her pregnancy, but refused to uh, a C-section because it was too early for her baby. Then she went into labor. He sighed, remembering the sadness of Dolores' passing, the night spent hovering over little Ethan in the neonatal wing. I still will sometimes wonder if I could have done more. Convinced her to have the C-section, or somehow delayed labor, I was still so green back then. I remember that case, and I also remember that you did everything you could. Most days that's how I feel, but sometimes it hurts to think of a little boy out there in the world without his amazing mom and his life. You all sit around the table in solemn contemplation, and then unexpectedly, Jackie chuckles. You know, listening to all these stories, it's uh, just driven two things home. One, that we're really talented, thoughtful doctors. And two, that we really, really suck at cheer Laylee up. You all blink, and then the dam breaks, and you all burst into loud, cathartic laughter. It seems to last forever, leaving you breathless with giggles. Oh man, I'm sorry, Bryce. We all came together to support you and ended up telling depressing stories all night. Actually, believe it or not, I do feel cheered up. It reminded me that there is something we all go through. Hearing your stories and knowing what incredible doctors you are helped me realize this isn't going to break me. It's going to make me a better surgeon. Which is good because I've scheduled to do an SVR tomorrow. But that's super complicated. But I'm glad you're back in the saddle. Hey, it's seeing you doubt yourself. It's important to be able to move on from tough cases. It's part of our job. I get that now, though. I think I needed that doubt, too. Before I messed up, I was too cocky. Afterwards, I was too afraid. But now, I feel like I'm confident in my abilities and aware of my limits. Significant limits, in fact. You scalpel jockeys might be uh, all limits. No worries, that'll uh, get too cocky again with you around. That's what friends are for, Bryce. Bryce leans back in a seat and smiles, a quiet, peaceful expression on his face. I know I did everything right, and I know no one else could have found, fought harder or done better for Henry. And in the end, I don't have any regrets. Besides, you remind me of something important that I forgot. Which is? Surgery is like surfing. You can't be afraid of the wave. And I'm not. Not anymore. I'll drink to that. In fact, all the, after all the stories, maybe a toast is in order? Nah. After unburdening like that, I figure we have to do something big. I always find a nighttime plunge into the Charles River cleansing. Oh boy, the river cleansing shit again. When Hope passed away, her parents invited me to join them in releasing one of those floating paper lanterns for her. I'd love to do that again. I'm leaning towards... Lining some lanterns. Perfect. And I just know the place to release them. We just need a few supplies first. A short shopping trip later, the 70 of you are standing in a nearby park, the night sky and the cityscape twinkling around you. Each of you is holding a cylindrical paper lantern in one hand and a lighter in the other. Aurora looks at hers dubiously. I've never actually lit one of these before. Are you sure this is, uh, is the right brand? It feels like it's just gonna drop. Trust me, it's like a hot air balloon. Once we get everything lit, then it'll be up, up, and away. When I did this before with Hope's parents, I sort of hoped, or focused on Hope, while I was lighting the lantern. Then we set it free together. It was very peaceful. Bryce nods thoughtfully, then flicks his lighter open, and lights up his lantern. For Henry. The white paper lantern glows with a golden light and fills with air in his hand. Jackie glances at him and back at her own. For Mr. Bosman. He lights up hers as well. One by one, if each of your friends puts the flame to the wick and lights their can lantern up. For Miss Thompson. For Dare. For Hope. For Danny and Bobby. For Dolores. You set your lantern alight, lift it, feeling a lift in your hands, holding on to it and all the feelings that are in it, until... Alright, now. 
side by side in perfect synchronization. You all release your lanterns, letting them rise slowly in the sky. You look up and on, watch as the glowing cylinders float like balloons, cluster together as they rise higher and higher. It's beautiful. Tiana smiles and hugs Aurora, who smiles and leans into the hug. Raph grins and throws an armor over Bryce's shoulder. Jackie links one arm in Elijah's and another in yours. I'm glad we did this. And I'm really glad we did it together. Always. Cluster together in a loose group hug, you watch as the glimmering lanterns soar higher and higher until they're only specks of light in your eyes. The next day, you pop your head in to check on Greg, only see him grimacing and scratching his hand as he tries to shift his legs around under the covers. Greg, is anything the matter? Oh, nothing new, just my ankle's ballooning again. And they really shouldn't be doing that in the hospital. He covers legs and immediately notice that rather than going down, the swelling in his legs and feet has only increased overnight. We know what, uh, we know what caused us, and we've got you on the right treatment. Your symptoms shouldn't be getting worse, unless we're missing something big. Think, Greg, is there anything you didn't tell us? Any... Allergies, or even minor ones? But sometimes allergies develop late in life. It could be something that seems innocuous, like a new laundry detergent. I've used the same detergent for ten years. Besides, I doubt the hospital uses the same brand. Ah, oh, this is true. Anything you can think of would help, Greg. Greg frowns as he thinks, scratching his hand again. Eventually, he shakes his head. I'm racking my brain, and I can't think of anything like you're asking about. I'm really sorry, I can't help. He sighs in concern, and then notices he keeps scratching the same spot on his hand. Has your hand been bothering you? Oh, this is nothing, just a bug bite, that's all. It's been itching like crazy. Oh, you dumb mother. <sighs> May I see it? He holds out his hand, and you inspect the bite more closely. He's drawn blood from constant scratching. It looks like a mosquito bite that doesn't make any sense. Not the season for mosquitoes, it's way too cold for them to be out yet. Well, when you're in Loading Plains, you run into weird bugs, no matter what time of uh, year it is. They come in the cargo. One time I was taking out a crate of bananas, no joke! This big furry tarantula hopped out. Man, you should have heard me scream. Oh, what do we like here, buddy? Come here. Come here. So, you think mosquitoes came from the plane's cargo hold? I can think of three things that mosquitoes from foreign countries might have that he might have. That would make sense. I've been picking up extra shifts lately, so it's cold out there, man. The planes are coming in from the tropical spots all the time. Greg, I need to take one more blood sample. I think I have an idea. Yeah, Dum Dum didn't tell us about a bite. A little while later, you triumphantly present your test results to the rest of the team. So you're saying it's membrosus neuropathy? It's a malarial neuropathy? The blood test confirms it. it uh, I noticed a bug bite on Greg's hand, and well, it looks like uh, my hunch was right. We didn't even consider malaria since he hadn't traveled internationally, but apparently the mosquitoes did. Once we treat the underlying malarial infection, his symptoms should improve. Like we caught it early, so his kidneys rec should recover. That was a fantastic solve, Casey. Don't worry, I'm sure, you know, here in like two cases, you'll be back to calling me anything but a woman. Thank you. I'm just glad Greg's okay. If we hadn't caught the malaria, his kidneys might have been totally shot. Ah, Ethan, looks like you picked the right case after all. No other team should have made this, uh, could have made this all. Ethan doesn't respond, looking off into space thoughtfully. You're all pulling, uh, together your things and preparing to leave when Ethan clears his throat awkwardly. <clears throat> Actually, before you all go, I have an announcement of sorts. You glance with Tobias and Harper, who look at, uh, as surprised as you. He's leaving, isn't he? I will be taking some leave, and I don't know precisely when I'll be back. 
Oh, I didn't see this one coming. Oh, wait, yes, I did. I called it. The room goes quiet, and a sinking, sick feeling fills your stomach. Ethan, what's wrong? You may as well know now. The fact of the matter is, I've been hit with a major malpractice suit, and unfortunately, I have a feeling this won't be going away so easily. Thus, when it looks like the team was back on track, Ethan's career has come under major threat. Will he survive this? Keep playing to find out. I'm assuming this is Bloom's attempt to take the shot and redirect it. Because it hadn't, like, he had missed him. But, listen, Angelina Jolie bit, like, bended bullets, so let's be real, okay? <laughs> Without further ado, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down to the description below. Links to social media, Discord, and if you use links to support me and my content. Consider becoming a part of this community by simply hitting that subscribe button. That way you will have access to over 3,000 videos on this channel. That's right, 3,000. Over. Well over. I have uh, some of the most, uh, well, biggest cultivated content on literally the face of this platform. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Do you want to be a part of this community or not? That way, also, when you subscribe, you also will receive notifications of when I upload more content and we have a lot coming. So, by the way, of content that is coming, which will be Resident or er, RE6, um, as well as Seven, and then I am will be streaming Village tonight on Twitch. Feel free to check that out. There is a link to that down below as well. Thanks for watching. Peace out.